I didn't mean, I'm sorry that I cannot be there today in person. Um, yeah, uh, the topic of this talk is going to be black hole spectroscopy. And uh, <clears throat> I will start with uh, a little historical introduction to the field, which is something I probably don't need for this audience. Uh, but you can basically see the first few slides as a brief history of overtones. And I will just say how um, overtones were understood in the early days of perturbation theory and uh, how they became very relevant again right now. And uh, uh, the second part of my talk is going to be about a topic that has been the subject of a pretty heated debate recently, and uh, that's whether we can really describe the full post-merger waveform using only a linear superposition of uh, random modes. And the elephants that you see on this slide refer to a famous quote that you will see later um, on overfitting. Uh, the question that I will try to address in the second part of the talk is whether we can measure overtone frequencies agnostically in zero noise, first of all, and second, whether we can really tell that the, that the merger is fully linear all the way to the peak of the waveform. And uh, you probably know better it's just law. Um, my answer to these questions is no. And then uh, I will also address another issue, which is whether we have been able to observe overtones in GW 15914 is again a rather controversial topic lately and uh, I will explain what we have done to reanalyze the event and the conclusions that we drew. And last, if I have a little time left, which I doubt, I'll talk about another topic that I've been interested in recently, which is whether the spectrum of black holes itself is stable or not and how we can find out using a mathematical tool that is called pseudospectrum. So, um, to begin with, uh, this story obviously uh, starts from the discovery of the Schwarzschild metric soon after the development of the Einstein field equations. And as you all know, um, the metric has two singularities. Apparently, one of them is a physical curvature singularity. The second one is a coordinate removable singularity. But from the very beginning, the key questions uh, concerning black holes and the Schwarzschild metric in particular were whether the Schwarzschild singularity represents the endpoint of gravitational collapse. A uh, first positive answer was given by Oppenheimer and Snyder, but under very idealistic assumptions, they considered a pressureless matter or dust and spherical symmetry. And later on, it was argued by other illustrious people like Lifshitz and Kalatnikov that uh, the, the outcome of uh, a collapse would not be a Schwarzschild singularity generically. And, uh, this question was addressed in a more physical context later on by Wheeler um, using tools from nuclear physics and uh, with the motivation that by that time the Kerr solution had been found and that there was the first observational evidence for what we now know are supermassive black holes. Um, and eventually, as you all know, it was solved through the Penrose Hawking singularity theorems. Now, if we believe that the Schwarzschild or Kerr solutions are the outcome of collapse, then the next question, of course, is whether this solution is stable. And that stability question can be addressed using black hole perturbation theory, the tools of quasi normal modes, and eventually led to black hole spectroscopy, which is the topic of this talk. Basically, the key tools were put in place by Roger Wheeler in 1957, who uh, showed that by using an appropriate angular basis, the tensor spherical harmonics and the Fourier decomposition in time, you end up with a Schrodinger-like wave equation of this form for perturbations of a Schwarzschild black hole that are actual or odd parity. And several years later, they really showed that a completely analogous result, but with a more complicated potential, also holds for even parity perturbations. Then, uh, around the time when they really found this wave equation for polar perturbations, the issue famously carried out this ring down scattering experiment where he observed that if you scatter a Gaussian wave packet off a black hole, what you find is a train of gravitational waves at infinity that looks like a damped exponential. And later on, these damped exponentials were understood to be the free oscillation modes of the black hole. They were shown to be excited by the Lisrofini press and price in some very simple um, but astrophysically plausible processes like the radial infall of a point particle. What you see here is the prompt response, then the peak of the radiation, which happens pretty much at the fundamental quasi-normal mode 
of the black hole with L equal to, and then you see an exponential decay after that. And later on in 1973, Tokowski finally developed a formalism analogous to the Roger Willard's really formalism that we can use to study perturbations or rotating black holes. Now, the key idea in all of these quasi normal mode calculations is that after the separation of the angular and time dependence, you end up with a time independent radial wave equation, which has the key feature that there is a peak around the light ring. The potential goes to zero at the black hole horizon and it goes to zero at infinity. Ignore this other curve that corresponds to a massive case, which I will not discuss today. And when you impose that you have in going waves at the horizon and going waves at infinity, you end up with a discrete spectrum of damped modes. They are damped because the system is dissipated and so it's not Hermitian and uh, this spectrum is called the ring. Now, the first calculation of the full spectrum was performed by Chandra Sekhar and Ed Beiler back in 1975. And the overtones have been a um, familiar friend for everyone working in gravitational waves uh, ever since the 70s. In fact, here you see a beautiful simulation of collapse um, done in perturbation theory by Cunningham, Price and Moncrief, where they see that if you take the L equal to waveform emitted in the collapse and you subtract the first uh, quasi-normal mode, you get another uh, damped exponential below the dominant signal that corresponds to the first overtone as it had been computed by Chandra Sekhar and Detweiler. And also, it has been understood for more than 40 years now that these modes are very important uh, in the context of gravitational wave astronomy. In fact, in 1980, when Steve Detweiler first computed the full spectrum of Kerr black holes, he pointed out that with the advent of gravitational wave astronomy, the observation of the resonant frequencies might be used to provide direct evidence of black holes with the same certainty as the 21 centimeter line identifies hydrogen. So um, the role of these modes for understanding whether we are observing black holes was clear from the very beginning. And the key features are shown in this plot. If you consider perturbations with L equal two, which are dominant because gravitational radiation is quadrupolar, you start off with a mode that has the smallest imaginary part or the longest damping time. This is called the fundamental mode. And then as you go up uh, and the imaginary part becomes larger, you get the first, second, third, overtone, and so on. And a similar structure uh, applies also to modes with L equal three, L equal four, and so on. This is true for the Schwarzschild metric. In the, if you consider perturbations of Kerr, each of these modes splits into a multiplet um, going from m equal minus cell to m equal cell. And the idea famously is that if you measure the frequency and the damping time, you can determine the mass and the spin. And then if you measure a second mode, be it an overtone or a higher L mode, then you can do a test of GR. Now, the question is whether it's easier to observe the overtones or the higher L modes of the radiation. And this is the key question that I will address later on. Let me point out that also in the context of rotating black holes, the, the overtones were observed very early on. There were simulations in the mid 80s by Stark and Piran that pointed out that you uh, end up with a curved black hole of different spins and the fit to the waveforms improves when you include overtones. Now, if we want to understand whether these overtones are observable, we need to understand whether they can be excited in a realistic astrophysical measure. And for the longest time, we didn't have the tools to do this because we didn't have numerical relativity. But um, uh, uh, Lieber's uh, seminal work showed that you can quantify the excitation of the modes by using tools that are um, borrowed from the theory of uh, ordinary differential equations. In particular, you can use Green's functions to show that the ring down is gonna dominate in an intermediate period of time. And you can use the, the poles of the Green's function that are pictured here to quantify what are called the excitation factors of the overtones. And later on, there was a bunch of heuristic work that was done before numerical relativity, pointing out that maybe there could be enough signal to noise ratio in the ring down to make it observable. And uh, in a paper in 2005, we tried to quantify the signal to noise ratios, measurability, fit the various quasi-normal modes and understand whether it would be more convenient to look at the overtones or the higher multiples. Things changed clearly after the simulations in 2005 by Pretorius and others, because now people could use the numerical data to see whether the overtones were excited. And what I'm showing in this a uh, figure is a plot from the Bonanno Pretorius in 2006, where 
What they did was they performed a fit of the waveform with a certain mode, and then they subtracted that mode from the waveform and observed that the residual looks like another overtone. And you can proceed like this and fit multiple overtones. The question, they already pointed it out in this paper, is whether this fit is feasible or you are actually overfitting the data. And in these other papers, we pointed out that maybe uh, the issue of whether you're overfitting or not can be bypassed if you look at the higher multiples of the radiation. There were several studies by Satya, Camarezzos, Sarah Gossan, and others uh, that improved on our work in many ways. Of course, all of the status of this field changed completely with the observation of the first signal, um, GW 150914, where uh, the question really is whether you can tell that there is a clean ring down in the post manager data. And here you can see the actual um, best fit numerical relativity waveform superposed to the noise. And you can see that there is not much signal in the ring down at all. In fact, the original LIGO paper pointed out that maybe there's a signal to noise ratio of seven in the ring down. And uh, clearly the situation is going to improve as we deal better and better detectors because with every improvement by a factor of two, in sensitivity, we can get much tighter constraints on the ring down, and uh, things will get even better with LISA for the simple reason that the signal to noise ratio in the ring down scales with the mass of the three over two. So even though the LISA noise curve doesn't look very good on this plot, the typical signal to noise ratio detected events should be very large. In fact, we pointed out soon after the first detection that Using different astrophysical models that you see listed here, it doesn't matter what they are. The only thing that matters is that we didn't have very massive black holes, such as the ones that we have seen later. Um, the, typically, you could expect detections to happen very early. But if you want to do tests by observing more than one LM mode, then you will need uh, more sensitive detectors. And these conclusions have been validated by various other people. More recently, there was a study by Ott and Cirenti that performs a Bayesian analysis and comes to the same conclusion that you really need third generation detectors to do spectroscopy with a single event. Stacking is a topic that I will not address here. Um, okay, and with LISA, however, uh, whenever you see an event, you should have a large enough signal to monitor ratio, you should be able to do this. Now, let me move on to the recent issue. The recent issue has been maybe, maybe we've been too pessimistic all around. And uh, maybe uh, we can just use the overtones to do a very clean test with GW 150914. And let me explain a few reasons why I think that these tests are uh, more difficult than uh, some people have been claiming. First of all, let me go back to the visual experiment that I was discussing at the very beginning. So now we are working in full linear perturbation theory and we are scattering a Gaussian. This was work led by my student, Mark Chung, and my former student, Hector Silva. Um, what you see here is the value of the frequency and the damping time that you get by fitting the waveform, the visual waveform essentially, at different starting times. And you can see that as the starting time increases, eventually you get very good agreement with the frequency that we know from the whole perturbation theory. But that eventually means maybe 20 M after the beginning of the waveform. Now, suppose that I want to do the test completely agnostically as proposed by the Twiler, and I want to fit both the first mode and the overtone. Now, as you can see here, if I try to fit two modes at the same time, the first mode converges to the true value relatively early on, at a time about 10 M maybe, or 20 M, but the second mode completely overshoots the known value of the first overtone frequency. And the reason for this is that overtones are pretty hard to excite, and you really need to know when they start, and their quality factor is very small. So fitting the overtone without knowing where it is, even in linear perturbation theory, is extremely hard. In fact, even if you assume that the first mode is known, the same problem occurs, as you can see here. The overtone just flies through the true value and goes away. And then uh, this doesn't mean, however, that we don't need the overtones. In fact, it has been known in linear perturbation theory that by including multiple overtones, this was the original study by Lieber, if you include more and more overtones, you can get a very good fit of the waveform up to the peak and possibly even before. 
And you can predict the values of the excitation factors in this case, and you can do it even for carrots, we have done in this paper. And it turns out that uh, you get good agreement with the full waveform at earlier and earlier times. Now, the question is whether the same good agreement applies also to nonlinear simulations of the merger. First of all, I do believe that you need to include overtones in uh, gravitational wave data analysis. This is extremely important. In fact, we pointed it out in a paper with Bishal Bai back in 2017, where we showed that if you do not include multiple overtones, then you cannot get a good determination of even the fundamental mode with L equal M equal to. And that translates into large errors on the mass and the spin that you estimate. So the bottom line of this paper was to say, do not do data analysis with a single overtone because you won't be able to recover the signal correctly and to estimate the mass and the spin of the final black hole correctly. But then what happened is that uh, there was a very influential paper by Matt Giesler and others where they made a much bolder claim, which I read straight from their abstract. It says, including overtones allows for the modeling of the Ringland signal for all times beyond the peak strain amplitude, indicating that the linear quasi normal regime starts, starts much sooner than previously expected. This implies that the space time is well described as a linearly perturbed black hole with a fixed mass and spin emphasis mine as early as the peak. And this conclusion, to come to this conclusion, what they did was they looked at the mismatch between numerical relativity waveforms computed with SXS that are incredibly accurate and a fit with N overtones. What you see in this plot is that if you fit with a single mode, you get a mismatch that gets better and better at later times, the blue curve. If you fit with one overtone, you get a sensibly better match that is consistent with what we were suggesting in the paper with Bishal. And if you keep adding more and more overtones, the mismatch keeps decreasing. And in fact, the local minimum of the mismatch eventually when you add seven overtones is at the peak time of the waveform. Now, the question here is whether this linear merger is justified, the linear fit to the merger is justified. And let me give you two arguments why I think one should be suspicious. The first is that there was a paper by Arnab, Dani, Satya and others, where they fit the waveform using counter rotating modes that I have not described. They are the ones on the negative real part of the complex plane. Uh, and what they found is that by including these counter rotating modes, you can get an excellent mismatch something like 10M before the peak of the waveform. But we know from black hole perturbation theory that unless you have very large misaligned spins, you should not expect these counter-rotating modes to play a very important physical role in the merger. And so the question is whether adding more modes just does better or whether it's justified physically. Besides, it's been known since the 90s that if you take head-on collisions of black holes, uh, the second order corrections are expected to be significant. And so one should be at, at the very least uh, a little suspicious and uh, make sure that this linear fit is solid. So if you look at the Giesler paper, what, what they show is the values of the amplitudes for the fundamental mode, first overtone and so on. Uh, when you include one mode in the fit, two modes and so on. Now, what you see is that the amplitude of the fundamental mode stays constant to a very good accuracy, but the amplitude of the first overtone can have relatively large variations, and the amplitude of the higher overtones can vary by as much as a factor of two or more. So the question here is, are we fitting a linear model correctly or are we overfitting? And there was a very famous case of uh, uh, overfitting in a way that uh, was reported by Freeman Dyson in conversation with, with uh, Enrico Fermi when uh, uh, Dyson had a model for uh, meson proton scattering back in the, in the 50s, I believe. And uh, he went to speak with Fermi and Fermi told him that um, there's two ways of doing calculations in theoretical physics. One way is to have a clear physical picture of the process. The other way is to have a precise and self-consistent mathematical formalism that you have needed. And then when uh, Dyson said that he was using four free parameters to fit the data, uh, Fermi replied, I remember that my friend Johnny von Neumann used to say with four parameters, I can fit an elephant and with five, 
I can make him wiggle his trunk. And over here, you see that people have actually published in the American Journal of Physics fits of elephants using four parameters. So this is actually possible. Now, the question is, are we overfitting or not? And let me go back to the linear uh, problem. So I will consider again the scattering of a Gaussian. And what you see here is the value of the amplitude when you fit one node or two nodes or three nodes and so on as a function of time. So if you try to fit a single dumped exponential to the data, what you see is that the fit is not quite a damped exponential because the amplitude is not constant. In linear perturbation theory, the amplitude should be constant. It only becomes constant some 5n, perhaps, after the peak. And then it stays constant to a very good accuracy. So I would say that after 5m here, you can reliably trust that a one overton fit is a good fit to the data. When you add two modes, what you see is that the first mode is a good fit to the data in a certain region, and the first overton starts becoming a bad fit to the data at late times. And I can tell you, we've been looking at the reason why this happens, and it's a combination of tails, which are there, and the numerical nodes. And then you can add the second overton, and you see that the constancy of the amplitude gets worse and worse, and the range in which you can fit the data becomes narrower and narrower. And in fact, if you do the same analysis on the Giesler data, you find the same thing. What you find is that about 12 m after the peak, if you fit with a single overton, you get a very constant amplitude. With two modes, you only get uh, that the two amplitudes are constant within about 10%, maybe between 12 or 15 m and uh, 28, I would say, m. And then the, the region shrinks. So I would argue that there is not much physical information that is coming from adding all of these other overtones. In fact, this argument can be turned around and you can use it to say that the validity region of the linear approximation is between maybe 10 m and 30 m, uh, if you, depending on the number of modes that you want to include, and it shrinks as you include more and more modes in your fit. One more argument that was brought by Matt Gisler and others was that adding all of these extra overtones really improves the value of the mass and the spin that you get. Here you see marked with a plus the actual value that you get from the full in spiral merger ring down. And what you see here is the mass and the spin that you will get with a single mode fit 47M after the peak which is a region where everyone will agree that linear perturbation theory is a very good approximation. And in fact, you get a great estimate of the mass and the spin from a single mode. However, if you try to fit a single mode at the peak, you get a, a value of the mass and the spin that is in disagreement with the data. And they argue that by adding seven modes, you can get excellent agreement at the peak again. Now, the question is whether you really need to add seven modes or you could add much less and get the same level of agreement. And what we uh, show in this plot made by Vishal is that if you fix all the modes but the nth overtone and you look for the final mass and the spin that minimize the mismatch, like Gisler, you find that the n equals zero mode gives you a very good fit. The n equal one mode gives you a very good fit when you change only that mode, but you see that the contours of uh, good agreement are becoming broader and broader. And when you start fitting the higher modes, the n equal two is still contributing some, but beyond n equal three, you're really just overfitting. You're not getting any improvement in the mass and the spin estimate. Okay, so this was all basically to justify that if you want to do an analysis with overtones and you want to trust linear perturbation theory, you should really be starting some 10M after the peak of the waveform, in my opinion. But um, after the Gisler paper, people looked at the GW50914 data, Max Easy and others, and they showed, once again, something that I agree with, the fact that if you fit the waveform with only one mode, you do not get good agreement with the mass and the spin. This is in line with what we were saying in the paper with Bishal back in 2017. But if you include additional modes, one overton gives you an agreement with the value of the final mass and spin that you get from the full waveform that is better. 
And then they said, uh, we conclude that we had detected the first overtone with a certain confidence that they quote to be 3.6 sigma, where by that they mean that this distribution of the amplitude of the first overtone that you see marginalized in this corner plot <coughs> is different from zero within 3.6 sigma when you consider these two confidence intervals here. But now, uh, I don't know about you, but if I look at this plot and I look at the marginalized value of the first overtone amplitude, I see some railing against zero here. And so the question is whether the fact that this amplitude of the overtone is significantly different from zero depends on the many assumptions that go into this analysis, in particular, the assumption that you're trying to fit the waveform very close to the peak. So what we decided to do was repeat the analysis. And we did a couple of things. The, we found that out of all of the many assumptions that go into this analysis, the main one is the uncertainty on the starting time. We just don't know the starting time accurately, and we have to estimate it by sliding full IMR templates on the data. So the uh, panels that you see in this figure correspond to this panel in the easy paper, but evaluated at different values of the starting time. Their chosen value of the starting time is, uh, I believe, minus 0 0.72 relative to what we found. And the dark brown panels correspond to an uncertainty of one sigma around our best estimate of the starting time. And the light brown colors correspond to an uncertainty of two sigma. Now, what you see is that including one overtone rather than only the fundamental mode improves the agreement with IMR, but only at times that are actually a little bit earlier than the peak of the waveform, where by all of the arguments that I've given you so far, you should not be expecting the overtone to give you too much of a physical contribution. And then what we did was we tried to understand if this better agreement when you include an overtone is caused by noise. So we looked at GW150914 like data actually the actual data in red, and we got the posterior amplitudes that you see here in red. These were obtained, by the way, with firing, that is the code normally used by the LIGO Virgo collaboration for ring down analysis, while EASY and others were using ring down, which is their own public uh, code, which is publicly available, by the way. And then in green, what you see are the results that EASY and others obtained after our paper appeared, which show that the amplitude posteriors are pretty much consistent with what we find, except they are narrower. And the other thing that we tried to do was inject GW15 or 914 like in spiral merger ring down waveforms in different stretches of data. And the blue contours that you see here are the amplitude of the overtone that we get by these injections. And as you can see, noise can uh, lead you into believing that you have a confident detection, just depending on noise fluctuations, either after or before the peak. But in particular, you, get, you can get very high amplitudes of the overtone when you go before the peak. And you can quantify all of this by the base factor. The base factors that you see in red over here are the ones that we obtained from the data. The green ones are the ones that um, easy and far obtained uh, from their data. And you see that in general, these base factors are always below one if you start after our best estimate of the peak. In fact, in the easy and far reanalysis, they re-estimated the peak using different models that you see listed here. And they came to a conclusion that their best estimate of the peak value is actually later than ours. So if you believe their best estimate of the peak value, you should be looking only at the data to the right of 0 0.72. And then you see that these amplitudes are pretty much for all of us quite consistent with zero. Since the KDE can be confusing. Mm, Emanuela, just a two minute warning. Okay, thank you. You can see here in the histogram the same thing that I was saying based on the, KDE, on the KDEs. In fact, if anything, our posterior amplitudes for the overtone extend to larger values. So at late times where uh, linear overtone superposition makes sense, we have a more confident detection than they do. 
Okay, the last thing that I want to mention only very briefly is that there may be a reason why higher overtones give you poor fits even in linear perturbation theory. And this is recent work that has been done by uh, uh, Jose Luis Jaramillo and others, and then we also had a paper in PRI recently with my student Mark Chong. The idea is that you can try to understand whether linear perturbation theory is a good description of the spectrum by considering perturbations. And for example, a non-linearity would be a perturbation on top of the simple eigenvalue problem that you consider in linear perturbation theory, or a matter around your black hole could be a perturbation. And then this pseudo spectrum tool that I don't have the time to describe tells you whether under perturbations of the potential, your spectrum is stable or not. And to cut a long story short, since I don't have the time, what Jaramillo and others found was that all of the modes in the spectrum are actually unstable, with the possible exception of the fundamental mode. And then we reanalyzed the fundamental mode, and we showed that when you take a bump, the flea in the elephant and the flea, that is located at a certain distance and has a certain amplitude, uh, you can find in general that this bump can destabilize your spectrum and, and produce a completely different spectrum that consists of all of the trapped modes between the main peak and the second bump. Now, I don't have time to go into this, but let me say that we are analyzing now whether this uh, perturbative instability of the spectrum has observational implications, and stay tuned because we're going to show you some results on this within hopefully a few weeks. I think I can uh, close up with this summary slide. The main points I wanted to make are that, first of all, overtones are necessary. We should include them. But maybe they are not our best bet to do black hole spectroscopy because I don't quite believe that they can be used within linear perturbation theory to fit all the way to the peak. Uh, I think that conclusions on whether we have detected overtones in current data are still questionable, uh, especially if you believe in my uh, second item here, but even if you don't. And last, uh, I think we should be very careful when doing spectroscopy study with overtones, because there could be fundamental issues in overtone physics that are related to these pseudospectral instabilities. Thanks. Patrick, I believe it's you, but I don't hear anything from I'm you. I'm just, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Perfect. Okay, good. So let's see. Questions? Hi, Manuel, this is Luis. So as you know, I, I share your sentiments, but uh, let me try an exercise or do an exercise on the other side. So it is true that we have plenty of evidence that nonlinearities will creep in when you think of head-on collisions or these uh, hyperbolic encounters. But a potential counter that one could say is, well, wait a minute, yes, but the, the systems that we're studying here are quasi-circular. So maybe in those, nonlinearities are a lot tamer, and maybe you could push it. Well, I mean, I, I still think that it would be a, there would be a hard time to get that argument through, but I, I, I'm curious to hear what you will respond to that. Well, I'm not sure that quasi-circular is bad in this context, because it, we have been looking, as you probably know, we said, uh, had on collisions of black holes uh, at uh, close to the speed of light. And the problem there is that even if you go to head on collisions at the speed of light in the equal mass case, you can radiate at most 15% of the total um, uh, energy of the system. So uh, uh, a system that is near head on in fact, reduces the amount of radiation that you can have. And when we did studies of grazing collisions at the speed of light, we found that maybe you could radiate up to 50%. Right. So, so uh, I, 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 that's true, but I mean, the way you drive the system is very different. So one is a kind of an impulsive uh, collision or driving of the system. The other one is very gradual. And this is one people would say, well, maybe it's quasi adiabatic and then things are more li more linear in some sense. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, you, you know that we've been looking for nonlinear modes in uh, quasi circular in spirals for a very long time, and we don't find any evidence for them. 
Uh, but I hear that other people have been looking. There was a claim many years ago by Lionel London and the Georgia Tech group that there was some evidence for nonlinear modes. Uh, for example, the 2-2 two, two squared mode in the 4-4 four, four component of the waveform. But um, in general, I think that it's always very hard to look for these nonlinear modes uh, because it's so hard to fit dumped exponentials. And also, evidence of absence is not absence of evidence. You know, so if you don't find the modes, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're not there. It could be that we're just not good enough at fitting the waveforms. And between us, maybe I'm, uh, you know, giving away too much, but I know that some people at Caltech have been looking for these nonlinearities and they have some interesting preliminary results. So it could be that these nonlinear modes are there. But in any case, the point that I'm trying to make is not how nonlinear the merger is. It's whether you can really use a fully linear model to the peak, all the way to the peak. And I, I just think that's too much. I don't know if I answered your question, Luis. You know that we had endless discussions about this, but. Um. Hi. So on one of your slides, you mentioned some early work by Alessandra and Franz and collaborators of, about like early attempts to look for this in their numerical relativity simulations. Right. So one question I had was, so if you have perturbation theory, it predicts not just the waveform at infinity, but also, you know, near the merger, right? Mm -hmm. So why do you want, like, if you have, a, if you're analyzing a simulation, why would you focus on only the thing at infinity and not the entirety of the perturbation? Well, mainly because that's what we measure, but yeah, but, I know that... but in terms of answering the theoretical question about is this is linear is linearity a good description of the metric perturbation? I would have imagined that you can get more information from everywhere. Definitely, but in current... and, uh, yes, it's correct. I agree with you, and in fact, there's a lot of people who are trying to make this connection right now, including, for example, people at Caltech and uh, Arnav Dhani and many others. Um, Abai Ashtekar, Satya. So I think it's very important that we understand the connection between the near horizon structure and the waveform that we observe at infinity. There are people that, you know, in conversations told me that they believe that even if you have nonlinearities near the horizon, uh, they would be filtered basically by the potential barrier and then you wouldn't see them at infinity. I think the jury is still out. There was a, an interesting paper by Masha Okunkova, for example, claiming that uh, um, these nonlinearities near the horizon would not be observable basically, basically by these arguments. But I think it's very hard to make a connection between local quantities and the quantities that we measure at infinity. And uh, all I was saying here is that if we look at the quantities that we measure, I don't think that a linear description in terms of uh, dumped exponentials can be pushed all the way to the peak. And I hope that I convinced you that there are serious reasons to worry about this. Uh, okay, thanks. Any questions online from anyone on Zoom? We'll go back to the room then. Uh, hi, Emanuele. It's Aaron. Um, I think I may have been the one, at least, who told some people about the filtering of the yes. horizon stuff. That was you ahead in mind. Hi. I've got calculations not not published. But anyway, um, my question was about the pseudospectra. So in the case um, where, for example, you modify the boundary conditions and get echoes, that also very much modifies the spectrum, but it doesn't actually modify the observed ring down in some astrophysical scenario, except then to eventually add echoing at a later stage. So do you have any understanding so far about uh, how much of a change in the spectrum really impacts the ring down? For instance, the ring down still may be fit to an excellent degree by the standard 
ring down spectrum, even if it's changed in a dramatic way. Yes, I agree with you. And uh, uh, these are the stay tuned results that uh, I, I was mentioning in the very last slide. I don't think I can show them yet because we're still writing up. But what we have is um, we've been looking at both the visual experiment and the uh, uh, falling particles and uh, looking at perturbations uh, of uh, the original potential produced by fleas of different magnitude and different location. And basically, yes, you are right. If you look at the first wave trend, typically, unless your perturbation is very large, you end up being dominated by the fundamental quasi-normal mode of the black hole, even in the presence of a flea. And after that, as, as usual, you see the echoes. However, what we cannot tell, even in this work in preparation that we are about to finish, is whether the flea affects the other tones to an appreciable amount. And I, I want to stress that this is still a very open issue because the instability that was observed by Jaramillo and the others starts off at the top. So you start destabilizing the higher overtones and then you come down. And the question is whether in a realistic merger, you are destabilizing all of the modes at the top or only some of them. And you, you really don't need matter to destabilize them. Non-linearities, you can see them as perturbations of the linear potential. So the question is in whether in a comparable mass quasi-circular merger, anything that is not linear perturbation theory destabilizes the overtones enough that you cannot extract physical information from them. So I would say sleep tight if you want to do spectroscopy with the fundamental mode. I think it's okay. Uh, if you want to look at the fundamental mode with L equal M equal 3, L equal M equal 4, again, sleep tight. If you want to do things with higher overtones and include many of them, um, we should worry. Thanks. Uh, just maybe to rebut slightly, in the case of, for example, a Kerr-Newman black hole, which is then a perturbation of Kerr, uh, nothing becomes unstable about the spectrum, I don't think. So there's also maybe the hope that for classes of physical perturbations to black holes, you also won't see an instability. I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. I do. I was talking recently with Costantino Pacilio, and I know that Ian Sweat had been looking at this issue, and there you had to worry about other things, because you could, for example, suppose that you take a Karen Newman black hole and you have a non-zero charge. Then, um, one sensible question, I don't want to scoop what they are doing, but I think we should think about this. If you have a perturbation to a Karen black hole that is induced by charge, can you really make sure that a measurement will tell you that you're measuring the charge of the terminal black hole, or you are just getting a degenerate measurement of a Kerr black hole with different parameters? You see? And I, I, I'm afraid that the answer is that we cannot really do meaningful tests. Well, I mean, you can look at the you can look at the way the quasi normal spectrum has shifted in the presence of charge, and there are strong degeneracies, but it, they're not perfect degeneracies. So, yes, if you have a high enough SNR, it should be possible. Uh, I've had a student do, yeah. do parameter estimation to this, to this degree, but, you know, we haven't <coughs> right. done and injection recovery, but it, it looks possible. I am more pessimistic, as always, and uh, you know the paper by Calderon Bustillo where he pointed out that as you increase the SNR, in principle, you should be including more and more overtones. And so the question is whether your measurement really improves enough as the complexity of your model improves. Anyway, there's, there's a lot to discuss. And, uh, I mean, I, I appreciate optimism, but <laughs> I always uh, tend to be on the conservative side. But that's just me, I guess. We've got one more question in the room, and then we'll get ready for the next talk. Hi, Emmanuel. It's Sean. Uh, first of all, great talk. I agree with everything you said. Um, one, my question would be, to the extent that you can't model the nonlinearities as a sum of overtones of sort of the end state black hole, um, do you, what are your thoughts on, is, is the, the, the key nonlinearity just the fact that 
the mass is evolving. And if you were to project onto, uh, you know, and they, that evolving background, you could fit with overtones all the way back to the peak, or do you envision nonlinearity manifesting in some other way? We tried and failed. So yes, uh, the, Sean, as you know very well, if you look at the variation of the mass and the spin between zero and 10 n, what you get is a variation of the mass for the typical GW1509-14 vanilla binary that is of order a few percent and a variation in the spin that is of order maybe 10 percent. And so the, honestly, the main reason why you cannot do it is just that, that the space that is still settling into the final color alignment uh, between zero and 10 n. And uh, then what you can do is you can say, okay, I don't want to fit with uh, the constant frequency modes of the final remnant with fixed mass and spin. I can try to make the mass and spin change with time. And if you want to do this, you know, there is your Bob model, uh, more or less. You, you can probably get a better fit, but... Um, at what price, right? Uh, I mean, you're not fitting linear perturbation theory anymore. And in fact, we did try, and even with a model where the frequencies change, um, you don't get a good fit at infinity. I can tell you that. We have tried it. Um, I know that also Laura Berna and others have tried a similar game, um, Luis and so on. So maybe you can talk with them about this. You get slightly better agreement, but it's a phenomenological model. And does it really tell you anything about what's going on? I, I'm not sure. Very good. Thanks again, Emmanuel.